Hello and welcome to Before the Week. It's a show where we comb through last week's news and current events in search of people who did or said something so flat out idiotic that we feel the need to share their story with you. And after we present it to you, we ask you a simple question. Who was the bigger buffoon? And you get to tell us in the comments right below this video or on any of our social media platforms. When we did this last week, you chose former Trump attorney and current federal convict Michael Cohen as Buffoon of the Week. But once again, the vote was split between our Facebook family and our YouTube friends. If only there was a way to provide a central location where all votes can be recorded together in harmony. I don't know, like a website or something. Hmm. For those of you who may be checking us out for the first time, we release weekly videos on Mondays at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. So if you like what you see in this or any of our other videos, go ahead and smash that thumbs up button and please subscribe to the show. We can literally taste the 200 subscriber mark. And once we get there, we're going to unveil a little expansion to what we do here. So help us get there. It's just a small click of a button for you guys, but to us, it means so much more. As always, before we reveal this week's nominees, we're going to lend the spotlight to some other buffoons who did their very best to win the nomination, but just fell short. So we now present this week's Dishonorable Mention. Yeah, <laughs> Clowns! Oh, come on guys, could you give me a little warning next time? Jeez. <clears throat> Everyone is worried about what's going to happen with school in the fall. For Rice University, it's going to look like Clown College. A news report last Friday indicated that classes will take place outdoors under the big top while managing social distancing. Just imagine singing in the Texas heat and humidity and paying college tuition to having to sit under a tent and you have to bring your own chairs to class. All of a sudden, online learning doesn't seem so bad now, does it? Next, we continue to catalog every Karen that we find in the wild. Meet Starbucks Karen, Amber Lynn Gillis who complained in a Facebook post last month about her experience in a San Diego Starbucks posting a picture of barista Lenin Gutierrez who denied her service for not wearing a mask. The picture went viral and a GoFundMe was set up in support of Gutierrez which raised more than $100,000. Now, Karen is demanding half of that money for being the victim of discrimination. I wanted to bring awareness about the discrimination. Gillis says she has medical problems, but also says masks are not effective. One of them, I get shortness of breath, dizziness, and it messes with the heartbeat. Um, and I do have asthma as well. So I do have, and I do get masking. So there's several things going on. And not only that, it doesn't even work. It was discrimination and, and everybody's okay with it and enabling and rewarding that kind of behavior. When asked if she has any apology or message to the public. Uh, no, absolutely not. I feel like I need the apology. I've been discriminated against. Oh, and about all those claimed medical excuses for not wearing a mask, all Miss Gillis provided was a handwritten note from a chiropractor. That's totally believable. Sure, Jan. How about this for fake news? USA Today supposedly fact-checked a claim that a Trump campaign logo resembled a Nazi eagle and even tweeted that the claim was in fact true. But wait a minute. When you read the actual article, it contradicts the tweet saying that while it is true that someone claimed the symbol was Nazi in nature, eagles are also a part of American iconography, so there's no way to call the symbol Nazi. So in effect, doesn't that make USA Today big fat liars? This is why you always need to fact check those fact checkers. Speaking of the factually challenged, we're back on the Bozo Watch. It seems a week doesn't go by without Bill de Blasio firmly planting his ample foot into his big fat mouth. Last week, de Blasio hailed the news that city prisons were at their lowest population since World War II and that the city was better off for it. What he conveniently left out was that the reason for the prisons being empty was his early release of prisons due to COVID. And apparently his definition of better means shooting incidents jumping over 250% from last year, a revolving jail door thanks to bail reform, and over 250 of those released prisoners reoffended, some more than once. So yeah, Billy boy, things are so much better. In fact, I think the city is dying from all of your improvements. And finally, this past week saw the emergence of the Kanye West for President campaign 
followed by the rumored closing of the Kanye West for President campaign, according to some sources, which was then followed by announcements that Kanye was planning rallies and working to get onto the ballot for his presidential campaign. Well, on behalf of all of us here at Buffoon of the Week, Kanye, we couldn't be more happy to hear about this. Hey, good luck with everything out there, and we hope you're still running when reality kicks back in. But until then, thanks for all the content. Even with all this buffoonery going on, there were still two nominees who were clearly the cream of the crap. This week, we pit New York Governor Andrew Cuomo against entertainer Nick Cannon. This week's first nominee is New York Governor Andrew Cuomo because he was able to commit three astoundingly buffoonish acts all in the space of one week. It all started with a victory lap. What we went through and what we did was historic because we did tame the beast. We did turn the corner. We did plateau that mountain. And then we came down the other side. And they will be talking about what we did for decades to come. I love history. I love uh, poster art. Poster art is something they did uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, when they had to communicate their whole platform candidacy on one piece of paper. So I did a new one for uh, what we went through with COVID. And I think the general shape is familiar to, to you. We went up the mountain, we curved the mountain, we came down the other side. What the actual hell is this audacious piece of crap? Oh, and the poster sucks too. The reception from both the public and surprisingly, the usually friendly left-wing press was to put it mildly, not too nice. New York's Democratic Governor Andrew Cuomo seems to be on something of a victory tour, congratulating the state and himself for defeating the virus, even selling this poster, which shows his state getting over the mountain by bringing down the curve during the 111 days of hell, as the governor put it. The poster includes references to his daughters and a boyfriend, little inside jokes. There are no illustrations, however, of the more than 32,000 dead New Yorkers the highest death toll by far of any state. No rendering on that poster of criticism that Governor Cuomo ignored warnings, no depiction of the study that he could have saved thousands of lives had he and Mayor de Blasio acted sooner. No painting there on the poster of his since rescinded order that nursing homes take all infected patients in. But let's be clear, this is revisionism. And a lot of the crowing and Governor Cuomo going on late night is, is offending a lot of New Yorkers. Are people gonna be talking about what Governor Cuomo did for decades to come in the way he hopes? But I gotta tell you, uh, Jake, we heard from a lot of people today. Some of it solicited, some of it unsolicited. And, and most everyone had some tone of, look, uh, let's slow this down, this, this victory lap. You know, our numbers, especially in downstate New York, weren't just the worst numbers in the country. We actually had the worst numbers on the planet. The poster deserves mocking, but it's a very serious subject, as you point out, between the nursing homes and the number of deaths. I, I, and I hate to make light of it, but my goodness, I mean, the idea that you put a poster out with yourself, your kids, um, and then try to mock the president at the same time after you've mocked him, I, I just, I, I really think it, this is like the political equivalent of jumping the shark. And yet, Governor Cuomo is extremely proud of his worst in the nation performance. He is now selling a retro-looking propaganda poster that touts New York's COVID response. He's bragging about it on Twitter and even on late night TV. Cuomo was too busy having fun to talk about any dead people, though. Uh, I have to ask for a friend. They want to know, and I won't say her name. She wants to know, what phase of dating are you currently in? Zero. I'm at phase zero <laughs> on dating. Uh, this is... There's no duration on phase zero. Yeah, uh, wow. There is no automatic time that you go to phase one. You could stay at phase zero for months, by the way. I think New York City will be fully reopened before I get out of phase <laughs> zero on dating. <laughs> once again, the reaction to Cuomo shenanigans was not very positive, especially from those who were deeply affected by his missteps. 
My husband lost both of his parents, uh, his mom, Dee, in an assisted living facility and his dad in a nursing home. Uh, they died of coronavirus alone. We never had a funeral. We never had a wake. We weren't able to see them before they died. Uh, and to see Governor Cuomo on television just this past week talking about his love life and this disgusting poster that is basically a depiction of 32,000 people that died. Uh, it's not funny, it's tone deaf, and it makes my heart hurt because we're still mourning our loved ones. If that weren't enough, Cuomo totally contradicted his own optics by decreeing that bars in the state of New York could not reopen unless they also served patrons food. Come on, man, what kind of celebration does it include booze? Bars across the state gave Cuomo the social media equivalent of the finger by creating cheap bar menus that made a total mockery of the governor. I mean, who wouldn't want nine fries for a dollar, right? If we can get serious for one second, Cuomo's mixed messages were not only poor communication to his constituents, but provided the absolutely wrong optics. The governor of the state with the most COVID-related deaths celebrating? Giving himself a pat on the back? Laughing on late night TV? The arrogance is real, and so is his hypocrisy. And it's also clear that the order he gave for bars was more about people control than it was about disease control. Take a good look, folks. This is buffoonery on a level rarely seen. Like what you see so far? Go ahead and smash that thumbs up button. Also, leave us a comment and tell us what you're thinking. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another show. This week's second nominee is the multi-talented host of The Masked Singer, Nick Cannon. Nick went off on a bit of a racist rant on his podcast with his guest, Professor Griff, formerly a public enemy, that was taped many months ago. And, well, rather than hearing it from me, I'll let Nick speak for himself. Then let's go, let's, let's go to what it really is then, when we talk about the power of melanated people, when we talk mm -hmm. about who we really are as gods and, and right. understanding that our melanin is so power and it connects us in a way that the reason why they fear black, the reason why they fear is because they the lack that they have of it. So then when you see what you know, Dr. Uh, Francis C. Wellesley talked about is that fear in that 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 uh, just genetic that annihilation efficiency mm -hmm. of when you have a person that has ha has the lack of pigment the right. lack of melanin right that they know that they will be annihilated so therefore however they got the power they they, they have the lack of compassion mm -hmm. that mel melanin comes with compassion melanin comes with soul that mm -hmm. we call it we call it soul we soul brothers and sisters that's the melanin that connects us. Right. so the people that don't have it have are are a little and I'm, I'm gonna say this carefully <laughs> are a little less and and and, and where the term actually comes from because i'm bringing it all the way back around okay. to, to minister farrakhan to where they may not have the compassion or the the when they were sent to the mountains of caucasus when they when they didn't have the power of the sun that was that the sun then started to deteriorate mm -hmm. them. so then they're acting out of fear they're acting out of low self-esteem they're acting out of a, a deficiency mm -hmm. so therefore the only way that they can act is evil so in order for me to be anti-semitic i'd have to be anti-black man anti-black woman anti-black people anti-africa anti all of the people because the semitic people are black people are black people so you so y'all get that clarity we're gonna say that again now, the semitic people are black people. so i cannot be anti-semitic now what do they really use the phrase anti-semitic to do that's the thing to divide it it's when it's never hate speech when it's not right you can't be anti-semitic when the semitic when, when we, we are the semitic people when we are the same people that you who they want to be, that's our birthright. That's our birthright. Whew, boy. That's just a small sample of a much longer show that involved conspiracy theories about Zionists, the Illuminati, the Rothschild family. I'm half shocked that there wasn't a corkboard with yarn in the background. There's not enough time to break down many of these racist tropes and fake science, but needless to say, Cannon got called out on this tripe and was even fired from Viacom. 
His response to being fired was just as bad, as Cannon fired off a statement saying that Viacom was trying to, quote, kick me while I'm down or force me to kiss the master's feet in public. Cannon did eventually apologize for some of his anti-Semitic statements, but by then, the damage had been done. Obviously, espousing racist disinformation and trying to pass it off as truth and science is a dangerous kind of buffoonery. But so is Nick Cannon's defiant double down, which was ignorance on top of ignorance. There's a lot of similarity here with last week's nominee, Deshaun Jackson, but just on a larger magnitude because of Cannon's platform. And did you notice how Farrakhan's name came up again? There's a root to all of this evil. When you lay down with dogs, you may end up with fleas. So when Nick Cannon hangs with known bigots and shares their polluted message, you tend to get lumped in with that same crowd. Hey, don't forget that Buffoon of the Week is all over social media. So when you're online, make sure you like us on Facebook, you follow us on the Twitters, and go on over to Instagram and like us there too. But the most important thing you have to do is remember to subscribe right here on YouTube. Well, another week's in the books, and you have two bigly buffoons out there. But only one can win. It's time to vote, America. Tell us who you got for this week's Buffoon of the Week. So thanks again for tuning into the entire show. You may have noticed we're trying to do some new and different things on it. This is all in preparation for getting 200 subscribers and unveiling a whole bunch of new stuff. What does that mean? Check back next week when we'll have two more nominees, but only one can be Buffoon of the Week. <laughs>